Go. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So, how many people have heard of Bitcoin? How many people own Bitcoin? Twenty uh, percent. How many people have heard of blockchain technology? Ah, uh, half. So the purpose of the talk tonight is to discuss Bitcoin and also the bigger story, the underlying technology of blockchain. And the slides are available online at slideshare.net forward slash Loblaga. My thesis is that blockchain technology is not just about cryptocurrencies registering wills and IP on black blockchains and bank transfers taking less than three days to complete, <laughs> philosophically, blockchains invite a new level of thinking about the sensibility of the crypto citizen and possibilities for societal shared trust. So blockchain is a new word that arrived in uh, Google, Google Trends as of 2013, and it's the title of my book, which discusses the potentiality for this kind of technology. There's an argument that uh, Bitcoin, fintech, and blockchain has really arrived as a sector for both venture capital and traditional investment. There have been numerous uh, recent articles in The Economist and MIT Tech Review and other publications. It arrived, cryptocurrencies arrived as a category on the Gartner hype cycle chart in 2014, a year ago. And really how we could think about blockchain technology is similar to uh, the way we think of the internet stack. So when we think about email, we know that there's a TCP IP general internet protocol underlying uh, transactions on the internet. We know that SMTP is an email protocol and then we know that there's an email application like Gmail. And so quite similarly uh, is, the bit, is the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, we have the underlying, the underlying cryptographic ledger technology is blockchain, and then on it runs the Bitcoin protocol, which is a protocol for exchanging one kind of cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. And then the application itself is Bitcoin, the digital coin, the money. So what is Bitcoin? We've been working on this kind of problem for decades, but finally Bitcoin is a digital cash that works. It marries uh, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing with public key cryptography. And it basically gets, it beats the double spend problem, which is when I send you a picture in email, you can download it an arbitrary number of times. However, with digital cash, you can only spend it once in the Bitcoin system. You have miners independently confirming the transaction so that that money can only be spent once. What we end up with is a secure network where any kind of transaction can be independently confirmed without the need for a centralized intermediary like a bank. So how it works is you would go to the web, download a wallet, and start uh, buying and selling Bitcoin and doing transactions. You can use Bitcoin in numerous locations. You can look up uh, different maps if you want to find out where to use it live. And you can also use it online at a number of vendors, particularly software and hardware vendors. And the benefit is that you don't need to then give your personal financial details and identity to the vendor uh, because that becomes a honeypot that can be hacked. We're all too familiar with getting letters from Kaiser or Chase or different oh. providers that our digital identity may have been compromised. But with Bitcoin, you're just sending the amount for the transaction and, and the vendor doesn't have uh, personal details about you. In addition, if you are a vendor, you might like to offer Bitcoin, uh, offer your customers to pay in Bitcoin because you can save considerably on the 1-3% to transaction fees. Similarly, uh, banking services can be provided with Bitcoin and that could help target the 5 billion individuals worldwide who are underbanked. Also, banking, traditional banks are using blockchain technology for their back office settlement to collapse uh, the cash transaction settlement time to near immediate as opposed to the three days. Remittances is another solid argument economically for Bitcoin that where transaction fees are exorbitant and money takes a long time to actually arrive, but I can send my developer in India Bitcoin instantaneously. Uh, a lot of people wonder, I've heard a lot about different kinds of cryptocurrencies. There's Litecoin, Darkcoin, Bitcoin, Dogecoin with a dog on the coin. 
uh, and which one to use. And Bitcoin really has a very, the vast majority, 85% of the market share, and all of the development uh, is being is being done on the Bitcoin blockchain. So Bitcoin is really the the technology, the cryptocurrency of choice. The trading activity has been um, tracking with the problems in uh, or the declines in China and the Greek uh, default situation. And the blockchain really is open source software. It's a protocol. You can just go to GitHub and download it, play around with it, and submit changes to the blockchain software if you if you would like to. It's an open source project. If you would like to find out who's running the full Bitcoin node uh, with all of the transactions that are ever happened, currently 6,400 nodes worldwide are running it, and you can find that out uh, easily at any time. There are numerous, uh, any kind of financial asset as well as document can be recorded and transferred with, Bit with Bitcoin or with blockchain technology, all public records. So smart property is, have you heard of the idea of smart property? A tiny bit. So smart property is the idea of registering any physical asset like a car or house on a blockchain and transferring it that way. So titles, the whole of a, a city's or municipality's titling system could be done on the blockchain <coughs> and property tracked and transferred this way. Um, there's a, one of the recent ones is Blocktrace, which is a diamond tracking blockchain or real-time GPS. What's starting to happen now is the ecosystem filling out for different kinds of decentralized applications that are the blockchain uh, version of traditional uh, centralized applications. So there's storage as Dropbox, there's Lazoo's as Uber, and OpenBazaar as Craigslist. So the ecosystem is developing. Smart contracts are uh, just like any sort of regular contract between different parties, uh, but posted to the blockchain for automated execution. There's a new area called crypto law, which is this intersection of technological law, and technological legal frameworks, and our traditional legal frameworks. And so the example is uh, a vending machine is a quintessential example of a code-based contract that we have in our society. Every time you put your money in, you get your item if it's not broken. Um, as opposed to people, we are much more flexible if we choose to comply with legal contracts. But the, the issue is that we may not be having smart contracts as isolated vending machines in our world, but rather whole industries like the mortgage industry may be outsourced to blockchain smart contracts. As an example is a law firm here in San Francisco, Robot, Robot, and Wong, mm -hmm. run by a colleague of mine, which is a very strong <laughs> nod to where the legal, the big data era of legal systems and potential smart, co smart contract distributed autonomous corporations. Blockchain IoT is a big application area where our smart home networks might run with the privacy and security and modularity of blockchains taking account of our, uh, our physical and mental health and doing that in a, in a privacy, uh, an orchestrated and private manner. Blockchain health is another big application area. The universality and accessibility and privacy attributes of blockchains mean that perhaps this is finally a universal framework for EMRs. We can also do uh, very large health data commons. We have uh, finally uh, making health a big data problem where we can have thousands and millions of people's health information, genomics, microbiomics, health history, et cetera, and run algorithms over that to finally understand pathologies and biology in a better way. And in gen genomics is an, uh, an example of another property of blockchains, which th is that they're uh, accessible and transnational. And so when lo local jurisdictions, like the US, prevent you from having access to your own genome, uh, information that's been sequenced, you know, perhaps the, some sort of cloud-based blockchain model could help you um, have access to personalized data that you would like to see. That flows in into the more general point about governance, that we're starting to have transnational organizations, uh, but we don't have really have transnational governance models. And so what's been happening is things like WikiLeaks, where uh, national governments put pressure on payment processors like Visa and MasterCard to prohibit the acceptance of donations to them uh, in a case of a transnational kind of issue. And so Namecoin is a decentralized DNS uh, system that is uh, censorship resisting. 
Similarly, uh, blockchain marriages don't need to follow the requirements of local jurisdictions. This was one performed in Miami in October of 2014, and um, where individuals can decide who they would like to marry outside of restrictions. Another governance example is here in San Francisco, neighborly uh, neighbor.ly, and they do self-directed community bonds, so you don't need to join a, a community-wide bond initiative. You can vote your dollars for projects that you like, as in terms of composting or new road uh, repair, whatever your personal issue that you would like to invest in, and the idea of personalized governance services would be. Another very interesting startup is called Sidekick, and this project allows you as a driver to automatically start recording and streaming audiovisual uh, data to the blockchain in the event of a traffic stop. So you would have a permanent record of uh, the situation yourself. Um, there are other kinds of governance options that blockchains enable, a uh, way to be have much more representative voting. And the idea of futarchy, where we'd like to vote for propositions, not people. Uh, random sample elections and other kinds of ideas. One of the biggest interesting properties of uh, functionalities of blockchains is hashing plus timestamping. So hashing is taking a digital file, no matter how big, a full genome file or a digital artwork or a software body or a will or contract, any size digital file and running a hashing algorithm over it, you get out at the end a 40 character, 60 character um, code that corresponds to what the contents of that file were at that time. And you can post the code to the blockchain as a confirmation of contents of the file. Not the file itself, you retain that, but the code is on the blockchain time stamped with a certain, at a certain time and date, and so later it's ascertainable whether that file has changed or not. And this is really the, the secret sauce behind how we might be able to completely reorganize how we do all law and governance and documents. And um, this is a picture of the proof of existence chain, uh, which does this right now. So science is a big potential blockchain application area as well. The mining operation is often criticized for uh, using so much electricity. However, some people say, well, that's still much less than our physical plant to confirm <coughs> transactions, i.e. banks. Um, and the Bit Bitcoin blockchain is actually the biggest supercomputer in the world. It runs at 42 petahashes per second. Um, your basic computer runs at one megahash per second. And mining is a process of adding transaction records to the blockchain uh, by performing a computing task that is hard to, is costly to execute, but easy to verify. And so that's what protects uh, the blockchain transaction records from being, from not being maliciously recorded. That that actual skin in the game is put into mine to confirm the transactions. Uh, however, there are some projects like PrimeCoin who are trying to use these uh, cycles of computing power for mining towards guessing prime numbers or supercomputing. ZenNet is a community supercomputing idea. And so we're trying to make better use of mining resources. One very interesting thing that we might be able to do now with smart networks is finally have a structure for friendly AI. So the argument goes that <coughs> digital intelligences in the future will be running on smart networks and to conduct any useful operation, they will need to have that transaction independently, independently confirmed and they will need to be in good reputational standing to do so where the consensus will only validate agent transactions who have good reputational status. And therefore, anybody, any transaction executed on a smart network must have come from a good, valid, bona fide player, and i.e. friendly intelligence, or friendly AI, or friendly human intelligence. So this, uh, there are some arguments to this, but the key point is that blockchains are finally a, a decentralized model where we can enforce certain good player behavior, and that could be interesting. So the, uh, as we think about consensus and affirmation um, of what happens on smart networks it's really, and reputation, it's really not about a transaction, it's about a game theoretic continued interaction and a relation. And here Derrida and Joyce are interesting in that uh, in considering what a well-formed affirmation relation is, where saying yes is de dependent upon the other to hear it and, and acknowledge it. 
So it's as if uh, Joyce had been writing about Bitcoin mining. <laughs> he said, uh, the two responses refer to each other without having any relationship between them. The two sign, yet prevent the signature from gathering itself together or totalizing. So what we can take from this as smart network designers is that uh, a concept of well-formed consensus, where we preserve, preserve the integrity of entities in a network of ad hoc relations. And this is really at the heart of Bitcoin. It's trustless that we don't need to know and trust the other party, but it's a trustable system. When, and then where parties are not total, totalized, they're not sucked into an entity like a government or a bank or a hierarchical structure, entities retain their integrity but, uh, but can be confirmed as to the operations they'd like to conduct. This is feeding into uh, crypto citizen sensibility, which is a new idea, a new relationship that we're having with authority and responsibility taking. So it includes digital safety practices like backing up our money, and it extends to thinking of the distinction between uh, selecting personal governance services versus being governed. And so now we take full autonomy for selecting our news and information and entertainment resources, but we haven't, uh, and now we're starting to be able to get there with economics and politics as well, that we can self-select our models. And this kind of freedom of choice, autonomy, and self-determination in economic and political matters too might, be, might start to be seen as basic human rights. This uh, makes us, and because in decentralized models, centralized governments can't do as much as they did before in terms of monitoring behavior, um, then it depends on us as crypto citizens to behave trustfully in, uh, in our interactions. Um, and so trust is really, is really this, this nub of what is starting to be happening. How do we create new models of societal shared trust? And we're doing that with smart networks and consensus realities, where trust is manufactured on smart networks through the consensus protocols and in independent confirmations of truth states. Smart networks are a way of making a new and pluralistic reality. Different network consensus protocols come up with different truth states about the world. And this means that number one, there are multiple realities. And number two, reality, we start to have the notion that reality is malleable and can be created. This is a very, some of the more philosophical issues that blockchains bring up. So we know that any trope has arrived when it emerges in culture and film. There's a Bit Film Festival uh, run by a company in Germany, and it's appeared in different cities around the world. There is uh, crypto art. These are some uh, fine art crypto wallets. There are wall posters, but they're also a way of storing your Bitcoin, a way of keeping your private key separately in a safe or something. And cryptographic art, they're in the form of, there is art stored in the Bitcoin blockchain in the form of this ASCII Bernanke. Um, posted a while ago as a, uh, a uh, thumbing the nose at the old centralized economic system. Data visualization is art in a sense. There are live um, websites showing the, the block, blocks being spent dynamically in different kinds of graphical formats. There's a, a Satoshi Dice betting game. And uh, the possibility of using blockchains for personal development contracts. So instead of giving aid to uh, a different country, doing a peer-to-peer -peer literacy contract with a student in a school. Also, perhaps having decentralized credit bureaus and open source FICO scores. So there are a number of blockchain applications emerging by sector, and each focusing on specific crucial properties uh, of the blockchain technology where, in summary, blockchain technology is a new form of information technology, a decentralized system of checks and balances, an infrastructure, an organizing system that is universal and at planetary scale. Philosophically, my thesis is that blockchain technology invites a new level of thinking about the possibilities for societal design and the sensibilities of the emerging crypto citizen. Thank you.